our first uh, keynote speaker, um, whom I warmly welcome here, is uh, Elena Fidian Casmier. Um, she uh, joins us uh, from London today. Uh, she is professor in Migration and Refugee Studies um, and director of the University College London Refuge uh, in a Moving World Research Network and co-director of UCL's Migration Research Unit. Since uh, the mid-2000s, uh, her research has focused on experiences of and responses to conflict-induced displacement with a particular regional focus on the Middle East. She has conducted extensive research um, in refugee camps and urban areas in many, many countries um, of the world. Um, drawing on a critical theoretical perspective, her work contributes to key debates surrounding refugees and local host community member experiences of conflict-induced displacement, the nature of refugee host donor relations, and both north-south and south-south humanitarian responses to forced migration. Um, among her many um, activities and um, publications, I just want to mention two. A first, um, a project that uh, must have come to an end uh, during the last days or weeks, probably. Uh, that's what I read from June 17 to June 22, a um, uh, European Research Council funded project, which is called South South Humanitarian Responses to uh, Displacement from Syria. And um, also, like from her extended publication list, a very interesting um, edited volume, um, which is called Refuge in a Moving World tracing refugee and migrant journeys across disciplines, which uh, came out in UCL Press and it's open access. So you can just go to the internet and download it and read it, uh, but not now, because now we first want, uh, of course, to hear um, her presentation. And as I um, introduced you the, the, the key topics of the conference, uh, we invited her to reflect with us about um, recent developments in the field of uh, refugee research so that we as a German network of refugee uh, forced migration research can better find our position and um, the way forward. So Elena, um, a very warm welcome and the floor is yours. So thank you so much, um, Professor Dr. Glodius, for, for your very warm words of welcome and for your very generous invitation to join you today. And of course, thank you to all of you who are um, physically present at the conference. I'm sorry I can't um, be with you um, uh, today, um, but also welcome to all of you and thank you to all of the all of you who are joining online. And I'm very glad that you, you can hear me both in person and online now. If technology allows me, I am going to share my uh, screen um, as part of my presentation. And here we go. Um, so as you will have seen from the abstract um, for my talk, um, over the past decade or so, um, it has become increasingly commonplace to uh, assert that there is a need to localize and decolonize both humanitarianism, but also refugee related research. And although the criticisms themselves um, of the existing um, model of research has been long standing. What we've been witnessing is an increase in the reach of criticisms of extractive research processes, which have historically viewed refugees as sources of information to be mined in order to advance the careers of European and North American researchers, or in order to advance particular policies and political decisions. But there's also been a corresponding commitment to exploring and implementing more equitable approaches to research, um, which actually position people with refugee backgrounds, not only as more than interviewees, but also as more than data collectors or as research assistants or as interpreters. Um, within such a context, two of my recent research projects, Refugee Hosts and Southern Responses to Displacement, which um, is actually still ongoing due to um, my having had to have an extension because of COVID and a number of um, health related issues. Um, but those two research projects have since 2015 and 2016 been working closely with people who have themselves um, displacement backgrounds, either personal or family experiences of displacement um, in the Middle East not merely as people to be interviewed, but as um, local 
researchers involved in writing, in analysing and in presenting their own findings on the relationship between refugees and so-called host communities, in the case of refugee hosts, um, but also on the nature and implications of responses developed by states, local organisations, communities from across the so-called global south. And I'm sure that um, many of you are familiar with or in fact have been leading um, or otherwise involved in many other projects which have been acknowledging and centering refugee researchers and refugee led organizations around the world. However, um, as explored throughout my um, southern responses to displacement research project that stated commitment to the so-called localization of research and the localization of knowledge production and indeed um, to decolonizing humanitarianism and refugee related research has also been subject to important critiques. And I won't repeat these here now, but I'll point you to uh, point you um, here to a video, a recording and a transcript, which is currently available in English, but will also soon be available in Arabic and in Spanish of a round table which my project um, convened uh, earlier this summer so that you can read and hear the arguments um, presented by scholars and practitioners including people with refugee backgrounds um, on the topic of um, decolonizing humanitarianism and uh, refugee related research. So um, through the www.southernresponses.org website you can access uh, the recording and the transcript to hear what Pat Patricia Daly, Marcia Vera Espinosa, Yusuf Mustafa Kosmia, Marwana Dinsa, Gisela Zapata and Jess Oddi make of that question and the ongoing debate that exists um, around, this, around this topic. So I, I, as I say I'm not going to reproduce what they've said but what I'm going to, to do is I'm going to um, argue that what stands out for me from the diverse critiques of refugee and forced migration studies is the importance both of carefully reflecting on the multiple approaches um, that have been taking place to localize and or decolonize refugee research and to center refugee voices on the one hand, but also the tension that exists between such commitments and the ongoing challenges of decentering hegemonic forms of knowledge production and of tackling structural inequalities and ongoing systems of exploitation and inequality. And indeed, over the past few years, um, scholars have increasingly argued that redressing the Eurocentrism of migration and refugee studies requires a commitment to a decentering of global North knowledge of and about migration and uh, displacement. However, it's less clear precisely what um, the epistemic decolonization of migration theory might actually look like in practice. And that's a, a quote from Grosfogel et al, um, who was drawing on Quijano's work on epistemic um, uh, decolonization. And um, in the context of, of this conference, what the implications of these debates relating to decolonizing knowledge might be for researchers conducting research in, for instance, European universities and institutions. So if we think about redressing Eurocentrism in refugee studies, one first um, entry point is that we know that academics and policy studies of and responses to migration have historically been dominated by scholarship produced in the Northern Hemisphere. So migration and refugee studies as an Anglophone institutional field of study um, was first born in and dominated by scholarship from North America um, since the 1970s and the 1980s uh, from Europe. In turn, the alignment of migration and refugee studies with the political and policy priorities of North American and European states has been widely documented and equally widely critiqued. And you have some references on the screen and there are further references um, in my introduction to the special issue of migration and society um, uh, titled Recentering the South in Studies of, of Migration. But I've in included some references on the slides as we go along. Um, and amongst other things, it's been widely argued that studies of migration and of displacement have very often closely paralleled the interests of states um, that are the main funding sources for many academics in North America and in Europe, and that um, these states often implicitly or explicitly direct research agendas 
rather than research, for example, really being aligned with the priorities and um, the, the aims of people who've been um, displaced themselves. So given that the hegemony of particular discursive frames of reference um, has been acknowledged, the question that follows is how do we redress that Eurocentric basis, uh, bias, sorry. And a key uh, challenge that arises in the context of this network or this conference is how the research of this network can engage critically with extensive critiques of methodological nationalism on the one hand, so the, the prioritization of the nation state as, uh, as, as the, being at the core of research in this context, but also critiques of Eurocentrism. Um, this is particularly um, 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 pertinent in the context of a network whose name so clearly centers um, what is a national or a linguistic marker, which is so closely tied to a country, um, which is often interpolated as being at the core of European politics and economics, and indeed given that German towns have long been marked as being at the very geographical core, uh, or the very geographical center of the EU. While critiques of Anglo-centrism, so the dominance of the English language, clearly align with the network's commitment to engaging with and advancing research conducted and published in German, the very inclusion and centralization of that term German in the name could potentially risk reproducing um, some systems of exclusion. So, for example, not all people in Germany necessarily speak German, um, and it's equally the case that German um, as, a, as a language is spoken as a mother tongue in, according to um, Deutscheland.de, uh, in over 42 countries. And it's wonderful to have over 30 um, countries represented amongst the participants, and this is maybe something that, that could be discussed further um, in, in the Q&A uh, &A session. Um, but it's also relevant to note, of course, that the very um, marker of German and of Germany is also historically linked with um, Germany's former colonies and protect, uh, protectorates. Um, so when we think about the, the, the reach and the relevance of the network, these are questions that arise in terms of national markers and languages. And a related question um, is the extent to which uh, German language um, research is tied to or critical of the concerns of German speaking researchers or of German speaking audiences, a question which is intimately linked to the increasing drive to ensure that research outputs are increasingly accessible to the people who've experienced displacement, not merely to other researchers, policymakers and practitioners. So one question um, is, does the title of the network feel inclusive from the perspective of diverse refugees and migrants in Germany, for instance, or is it more inclusive for members of the broader so-called German speaking diaspora? And that's a question that I can't answer empirically, of course, um, but one that I offer as a provocation, um, also linked to those questions of audiences, national markers and languages. Now, stepping back to the broader debates that I've um, started referencing, let's turn to the question of how to redress the Eurocentric bias of refugee related research and how um, different scholars um, have approached this um, topic within contemporary research. And here, I'll, again, I'll draw on my introduction to that special issue of, of migration and society, which is also open access, so freely available for you to, to download and read online. So the first approach um, that has been taking place across um, academia um, is that taking as their starting point the acknowledgement that many concepts in the field of migration and refugee studies are far from universal. Actually, scholars have been examining the applicability of a range of so-called classical concepts and frameworks in countries that are not classified by scholars or politicians as, I quote, Western liberal democracies. So here you could have a look at the work of um, Adamson and uh, Surabas um, and also Nata. And in this vein, researchers have been critically drawing on research that has actually been conducted in countries of the so-called global south to explore concepts, policies and programs originally developed from the vantage point of European states and international, read northern led, intergovernmental organisations. A second approach that scholars and indeed politicians, policymakers, and UN agencies have pointed to is promoting and funding 
further studies of migration in the global south and also more studies of south-south migration and indeed redressing um, uh, researching processes of south-south migration can be seen as redressing a widely acknowledged historical imbalance and as offering an important corrective to northern state and non-state discourses which depict the north as a magnet for migrants and refugees from across the global south. At the same time, however, the extent to which policymakers and practitioners uh, and politicians in Europe and North America have expressed an interest in better understanding and promoting South-South migration raises concerns, quoted here on the screen, that Northern actors might precisely be instrumentalizing and co-opting Southern people and dynamics, in this case, migrants and migration flows, to achieve the aims established and promoted by Northern states and institutions. And such critiques and concerns resonate with a third approach reflected in the broader field of uh, refugee and forced migration studies and the broader field of migration studies writ large, in fact, which is engaging critically with the geopolitics of knowledge production. Now, on the one hand, researching migration in the South or about South-South migration can be seen as a continuation of normative and hegemonic research policy and political practices, rather than necessarily being part of a commitment to either decentering the North or recentering the South, terms that are arising in, in the broader literature. On the other hand, a parallel constellation of debates has been um, taking place across a number of disciplines and fields, taking a different route to challenge the Eurocentric basis of um, the Eurocentric bias of migration studies, highlighting the importance of acknowledging that there are multiple ways of knowing, including epistemological perspectives and methodological approaches that have been marginalized through the coloniality of knowledge. And amongst other things, such scholars aim to resist Eurocentrism by building on a range of long-standing theoretical and methodological interventions that can variously be posited as post-colonial, decolonial, and or Southern in nature. I don't have time to go into um, detail on what those different frames might be. I refer you to um, the, the, the um, authors um, cited on the screen um, and also to, uh, to that introduction to the special issue on recentering the South. But to illustrate, for example, uh, Samir Amin and Chakrabarti have provincialized, I quote, uh, European and Eurocentric systems of knowledge that have been artificially constructed throughout history as universal, precisely by denying or marginalizing the existence of non-European or non-Western forms of knowledge. Beyond the applicability of classical um, concepts, such as integration, for example, in the global south, it involves resisting what Connell refers to as methodological projection, through which data from the periphery, I'm quoting here from, uh, from Connell, through which data from the periphery are framed by concepts, debates, and research strategies from the metropole. Likewise, decolonial and postcolonial scholars have also been attentive to the potential of provincializing European ways of being and knowing by shifting the geographical focus of the critical academic gaze. And this includes the potential of seeing Europe through Caribbean eyes, which is something proposed by Manuela Boaccia, for example, um, and also by Gerard so throughout, decolonial and postcolonial um, scholars have thus been critiquing the ways that particular directionalities and modalities of displacement and specific groups of refugees have been constituted as problems to be solved, including through processes that are deeply inflected by gender, class and race. And we've obviously seen that most recently in terms of how some refugees are welcomed um, and um, other refugees are excluded. Um, through processes deeply, deeply connected to racialization and um, ongoing systems of inequality. But in doing so, many of these scholars are part of a broader collective that argues that there is a need to challenge the very foundations and nature of knowledge production, to decolonize migration research in Vanyoro's terms, and to acknowledge and resist the ways that, de, um, that refugee and forced migration research is embedded within and reproduces neoliberal and neocolonial systems of exploitation. <laughs> 
Now, in essence, what this brief summary of three key approaches to redressing Eurocentrism in displacement studies um, highlights is that although these and other approaches often overlap in a given article or book, one can be a scholar who acknowledges the hegemony of northern and Eurocentric um, migration studies with its tendency to prioritize researching migration from the south to the north through concepts and frameworks that are often aligned to European and North American state um, interests without necessarily being interested in decolonial thinking or challenging neocolonial knowledge production or migration control. Equally, while decolonial scholars may prioritize studying migration through southern theories and epistemologies from the south, one can also be a post-colonial and decolonial scholar who, while critiquing these very constructs, conducts research in and in relation to the north, rather than empirically exploring processes of migration taking place in and across the south. And here, of course, members of the German Network of Forced Migration Studies have and can continue to have a very important role in these, in these debates and these approaches. So a final thought that I'd like to share with you, and I look forward to hearing your thoughts on, relates to taking this um, notion of the politics of knowledge production and of promoting or including refugee voices um, a step further in relation to the work of the German network. So many um, scholars and, and, and activists advocate enhancing refugee participation and including refugee voices as part of a broader commitment to ensure that the mantra nothing about us without us is maintained. Now, I note that this is a key mantra which is becoming increasingly popular in res refugee advocacy spheres, but which itself originates from um, disability justice ad advocacy and also homelessness rights advocacy. However, although there is this um, increasing push for increased participation and also for recentering certain voices, um, other people argue that what is needed is a much more radical and much deeper shift. So Wal Walter Mignolo um, proposes that this shift can only be achieved through de-Westernization, which in his words means, I quote, within a capitalist economy that the rules of the games and the shots are no longer called by western players and institutions it is in his view only through de-westernization that we can go beyond the insufficient step of aiming to change the content of the conversation and instead take up the essential challenge of changing the terms of the conversation However, Ashil Mbembe disagrees with the di diagnosis of de-Westernization as the solution to these inequalities. On the one hand, he agrees that decolonization is not just about design tinkering with the margins, I quote, and drawing on the work of Franz Fanon, he holds that Europe must not be taken as a model or a paradigm to be imitated or mimicked. But he powerfully argues that decolonizing knowledge is not simply about de-Westernization. Indeed, elsewhere, I've argued that knowledge production is intrinsically linked to simultaneity, relationality, and mutual constitutiveness. And if we um, accept this, then de-Westernization is insufficient precisely because, again, the words are Ashil and Bimbas, precisely because the Western archive is singularly complex and because this archive contains within itself the resources of its own refutation. So Mbembe argues that the Western archive, and here we can substitute Western with German, for example, the Western archive or the German archive of knowledge is neither monolithic nor the exclusive property of the West. And Mbembe maintains that Africa and its diaspora, for example, decisively contributed to the making of this archive and should legitimately make foundational claims on it. Now, this, I think, is particularly relevant when we're thinking about Eurocentrism, in this case, placing Germany or at least German at the centre and to think carefully about um, uh, who is being imagined as being the owner and the producer of knowledge in Germany, and indeed who is imagined as being German, and the ways that racialist and racist imaginaries of nationhood, which are at the core of European countries, rich large, um, in, including in Germany, kind of inflect contemporary um, research in this field. 
But it's also a matter of rethinking the role of Germany's African colonies or of German speakers outside of Germany um, with regards to the archive of knowledge um, in, in this context. So it isn't only the case that Africa, in the context of Mbembe's work, or refugees aren't already part of the archive. Of course they are. They are part of the archive. They are already part of the knowledge production systems which are drawn upon. And indeed, they have foundational claims on this archive of knowledge. Um, so it, it's not that de-Westernization is needed, but rather that European research is deeply connected to and has its foundational origins in um, spaces such as um, Africa um, and the people who are currently labelled as refugees um, have foundational claims to existing systems and historical systems of knowledge and of archives of knowledge. So I'm going to just move um, towards uh, my conclusion. So there's a, a long history of implicitly and explicitly dismissing the intellectual and conceptual work of people positioned outside of the Northern Academy. And this history has been characterized by exploiting and extorting, to use um, Hundoji's terms, their words to develop concepts and theories rather than acknowledging their words as concepts as theories and as knowledge in their own right. As Ashil Mbembe argues, critiques of the dominant Eurocentric academic model include, I quote, the fight against what Latin Americans in particular call epistemic coloniality. That is the endless production of theories that are based on European traditions are produced nearly always by Europeans or Euro-American men who are the only ones accepted as capable of reaching universality a particular anthropological knowledge, which is a process of knowing about others, but a process that never fully acknowledges these others as thinking and knowledge producing subjects. So far from taking it for granted that only white theorists have produced and subsequently own key concepts and theoretical approaches with um, reference to, to forced migration and that they must be cited appropriately, it's important to disrupt citational practices that have long been implicated in bordering no knowledge, bordering knowledge and keeping certain people at the center of such systems while excluding others. And in line with this reflection, attention must be paid not only to the questions of who produces knowledge, when, why and how, all of which are key for feminist and decolonial theorists alike, but also of what kinds of knowledge is acknowledged and cited as knowledge and on whose terms. So in this regard, a further significant challenge emerges when going beyond identifying Eurocentric biases and aiming to redress gaps in knowledge. This is the importance of not only recognizing, but indeed centralizing the knowledge and the conceptualizations of people who have been displaced and or who are responding to migration in different ways. And if our starting point is, which I believe it should be, the acknowledgement that people have heterogeneous experiences of displacement and are active agents whose capacity to act is restricted by diverse systems of inequality and violence, it subsequently becomes necessary towards, uh, to, sorry, to go beyond collecting or documenting such experiences, voices and acts. So from this starting point, it becomes necessary to challenge rather than reproduce the assumption that migrants and refugees merely experience, are affected by and or respond to migratory and displacement processes, and that it is only through critical scholarly attention that these experiences can be analysed for us to make sense of their lives and words. And throughout, I've been using their and them in inverted commas, because I think it's something that we need to be very, very careful with in terms of how we imagine who researchers are, the assumption, the imagined assumption that researchers are not refugees and that our research subjects are. What would happen if we started through the framing of we as a community, um, including the recognition that researchers have always included people who have um, displacement backgrounds um, and for whom the we and the them uh, or the I and the other is, is, bl uh, is blurred rather than so distinctive. Now, in the powerful words of Migration and Society's Creative Encounters editor, Yusuf Mustafa Kasmir, it's essential to reject the violence of projects that take ownership 
of migrants and refugees' voices, even, or I would posit especially, when these projects are undertaken ostensibly to subsequently give voice to refugees. And it is in this context that Kasmir posits the aim of, um, uh, in his case, the, the creative encounter section of, of the Migration Society Journal as follows. The aim is to embroider the voice with its own needle, an act proposed to problematize the notion of the voice, something that cannot be given to anyone since it must firmly belong to everyone from the beginning. He continues that it is essential to problematize the notion of the voice as it is often perceived and mobilized, a medium offered to those in need of their voices, rather than as a prior state of being that is initiated by and therefore intrinsically belongs to the individual herself. In this vein, to embroider the voice with its own needle is to see the voice within its owner as a given and not to be given. So such a commitment, such an aim, means thinking carefully about how and why we quote refugees and those responding to migration, and to recognize that analysis and theorization are not the preserve of academics and practitioners. People who are involved in displacement processes conceptualize their own situations, their positions, their responses as everyday theorists, rather than as providers of data to be analyzed and to provide the materials for conceptual and theoretical scholarship, as I've, um, as I've argued elsewhere. This means that it is urgent for us to focus intently on identifying and challenging the diverse structural barriers, including academic, political, economic, cultural and social ones that prevent certain people's understandings and worldviews from being perceived as knowledge. And here the relationship between the speaker, the spoken and the process of speech itself is relevant or the enunciated, the enunciator and the enunciation. So Walter Mignolo, for example, draws attention to the need to shift the attention from the enunciated to the enunciation. So it's not merely about adding uh, a new speaker in the room, but actually thinking about the process of speech itself. Equally, Gayatri Spivak famously interrogates, can the subaltern speak, in ways that focus both on the subaltern speaker, the enunciator, and the structurally unequal processes of enunciation that exist. And Homi Baba centralizes and conceptualizes the third space, as I quote, a contradictory and ambivalent space of enunciation by arguing in terms that might be read as resonating in some way with the Chicana theorist Gloria Anzaldúa's conceptualization of nosotras, nosotras being the Spanish term for we, feminine, uh, feminine plural, which brings together nos, us, otras, others, and rather creates as its whole the we. Uh, and the third space, Homi Baba argues, it is in this space that we will find those words with which we can speak of ourselves and others. And by exploring this hybridity, this third space, we may elude the politics of plural, of por, excuse me, of polarity and emerge as the others of ourselves. So again, it's to draw attention to the way that we can go beyond speaking of us and them, go beyond assuming that refugees are other and rather conceptualizing research as a process which involves the collective, the we, um, with refugees and people with displacement backgrounds as always already having been speakers and researchers in their own right. So in particular, it is a focus on the unequal processes of listening and recognizing speech as more than words that emerges as being pivotal here. In addition to considering which topics, geographies and directionalities of displacement are being explored and which scholars or enunciators are being cited, for example, women of color, Southern scholars, etc., it is essential to remain critically attention to the conditions under which processes of enunciation take place are in, and are engaged with. As Bell Hooks argued over three decades ago, I read um, from her words, certainly for black women, our struggle has not been to emerge from silence into speech, but to change the nature and direction of our speech, to make a speech that compels listeners, one that is heard, the voices of black women. In the past, they could be tuned out, 
could become a kind of background music, audible but not acknowledged as significant speech. So this thus involves being attentive to who is positioned as being capable of producing significant speech, including across intersecting vectors of gender, race, migration and refugee status, and as mentioned earlier, also what kinds of knowledge are actually viewed as significant in their own right. So within the context of such ongoing debates, sensitive to the multiple foundational claims that exist to European archives of knowledge, and the multiple locations and positionalities of people conducting research and otherwise responding to displacement around the world, I'll just end my presentation now with an open question for the network. How do and how can the critiques um, which are inherent within these critical theoretical frameworks, how do such critiques relate to the current and future practices of refugee studies, especially in the context of the German network for forced migration studies and also beyond? Thank you very much. Thank you so much, dear Elena, for this uh, thought-provoking presentation. And um, we will now come to the discussion. And Olaf, I see Olaf, the head of the German network of <laughs> migration yes. research. Yeah, thank you, Elena, so much for, for your thought-provoking um, keynote and, uh, of course, your, also your challenging remarks. Since you, you do address the name of the network, I thought maybe I should uh, address that. And um, I think you, you really um, made some really important points that will certainly be important for us to discuss um, maybe later tonight at, at our, um, uh, at our um, members' meeting. Um, but uh, so maybe maybe to give some background on, on the name, because the name, the German is, is not in the German original name. So there is no Deutsches Netzwerk. Um, it, it was really um, uh, added in the English name um, to make sure that it's not, that we don't represent all refugee studies. And in a way, um, I think it's, it's a really um, interesting point that I think we never discussed the question of how to address like other German language uh, communities and countries, because most of all what we thought about was Germany, Austria and Switzerland. And so there, of course, for us, there is a certain idea of regionalization also of refugee studies. So I was wondering, how do you feel that, or how do you think uh, decentering relates to also the other trend of regionalization in refugee studies? And uh, does that have a certain point to do that? Um, maybe another question that I thought was really interesting because it also was kind of a bit contradicted uh, my opening remarks or welcoming remarks that unfortunately were in German, but where I, um, suggested that refugee studies is not necessarily just about refugees, but um, is probably just as much um, about non-refugees and how they respond to uh, the refugee experience, and that we can learn much more also about um, those societies and politics um, by looking at their responses to, to refugees. So how would you think does that fit into to your approach? Thank you. Thank you so much, Olaf, and it's lovely to hear you, even I can't, I can't see you now, and I, I hope that you're well. Um, so, I, um, first of all, in terms of regionalization, it's, it's a tricky one within academia, because there is simultaneously an increasing interest in regionalization, but there's also a push against area studies taking place in some, um, in some academic spheres. Um, so, for example, in UCL, my university, University College London, the Institute of Advanced Studies has an initiative which is remapping area studies. And it just so happens that the Refuge in a Moving World Network is part of that initiative to remap area studies, recognizing that sometimes the regional descriptors are intimately tied with colonial um, frameworks of, of control, of, of demarcating the world and creating the region, the Middle East, for example, um, rather than using other regional descriptors. So there's simultaneously a push towards regionalization, but also a push against area studies and 
identifying, for example, South-South forms of connection, which might mean that there are better conversations to be had between Brazil and Mozambique, for example, than there would necessarily between Brazil and Chile. Um, so there, there are different ways of thinking about conversations and, and um, the, the, the purpose of those conversations as well. And one, you know, I found it very stimulating to, to prepare this keynote precisely because of that question. Well, is it a matter of German language researchers? Is it a matter of German language audiences? Um, what is it that unites Germany, Austria and Switzerland beyond the language? Um, is it also the policy frames? Is it, is it also the political uh, responses um, that, that exist within the field of, of of displacement studies. Um, but then, yes, what happens if we bring in German speaking um, researchers and audiences from around the world? How would that potentially shift the questions and the approaches that might be taking place? Um, so not a not a concrete answer at all, but just rather an acknowledgement that there are different ways of thinking about connections and conversations and that language might be one way of thinking about it. Geography might be another, but that also that there's a push against regional markers or, or at least an interrogation of what makes the region and why that region rather than another way of thinking about connections and connectivities. Um, in terms of refugee studies being more than just about refugees, I entirely agree. Um, my refugee hosts research project, which um, has ended now um, uh, in spite of refugee hosts um, continuing because of the extension, um, which is precisely about the relationship that exists between refugees um, or uh, between people with displacement backgrounds and with other members of, of different communities. But also in um, even in the title refugee hosts and interrogating whether there is actually that, that clear cut a distinction between refugee and host. So a lot of the work that we've been doing in the Middle East is recognizing precisely that people who identify themselves as hosts today in, in Beirut, for example, have themselves personal and family experiences of internal displacement and of um, international displacement themselves. So hosts are often people who have been refugees in the past and people who are refugees today have often hosted displaced people in the past as well. So over one third of our Syrian interlocutors in, uh, in Beirut route, for example, had previously hosted um, internally displaced people in addition to Iraqis, um, for example, um, during previous conflicts. So actually interrogating who is the refugee and who is the host, or rather than, or, or not at least taking it for granted, um, is, is, I think, important in that context. So thinking about relationalities, definitely, I would agree with you, um, is very important. And not fetishizing the figure of the refugee, but potentially using um, the notion of refuge as an entry point, as we do in the um, Refuge in a Moving World network, network. What is it if we start with refuge as the starting point uh, or, or displacement as a process as the starting point, rather than the figure of the refugee themselves? Um, might that lead again to different questions and different um, um, uh, areas of, of, of interest to people who have been displaced and people who are responding to them, who have multiple um, migration and um, uh, legal statuses, um, etc. So thank you for your questions. And um, I you know, think this is a, a fantastic network and it's wonderful for me to have the opportunity to, to learn more about the work that you, you have been doing and also to see how it's evolving. Um, so again, thank you, Olaf. Thank you so much. And um, we are looking out for the next speaker. First, you have to concentrate, you know. Um, I think um, I have to say I've passed 23 years of my life in Central America and Mexico. And um, the last 10 years I was um, head of a research center. Now I'm back here in Germany, a little bit lost, but but you know what I want to say. I think um, um, the discussion about decolonizing um, has other parts we should uh, talk about. For example, in my opinion, um, it's not so important to change this, the color of the skin of the researchers. It's more important to change um, um, the money where the money comes from. For example, in Central America, normally the Americans give the money for the research. And when it's not an American, it's an inter-American bank or Latin American bank or Central American bank. And when they give the money, they do that for one month or two months and they have um, um, very um, 
good um, developed rules and you have to find the answer for specific questions. So there is no independent research. And you depend so much on what other people tell to you that you cannot have a voice. So um, the problem is when you want to develop this kind of research centers, you have to change the financing instruments. And that's something we have to talk about um, very intensively because um, the kind of equity or justice we are talking about between West or North and South needs some um, other topics than only uh, cultures. It needs financing and independency and uh, and this is worth especially uh, to mention for um, countries that needs much more development. I'm not talking about Brazil or Argentine, for example, I'm talking about Central America. You know, there are research centers, but they are um, so dependent on other countries and other institutions, you cannot do anything. All right, thank you. So this is a question about the power of money mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, the political uh, structures uh, which uh, frame research agendas. I think this is also a question which is very familiar to uh, the, the German uh, uh, funding uh, schemes mm -hmm. and uh, researchers who are trying to get money from those schemes. Uh, so the question goes to you, Elena. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, an incredibly important question. So the conditionalities attached to funding, whether it's the conditionalities of humanitarian programming or the conditionalities of funders, um, very, very clearly um, demarcates what is possible um, and how work, is, uh, work, work can actually take place. I've added a link in the chat bar to the Critical Reflections Roundtable that we had on decolonizing humanitarianism and refugee-related research, in which my colleagues Marcia Vera Espinosa and Gisela Zapata are discussing as well the context of research um, in, in South America, um, not just in Brazil, but, but also in, in a number of other contexts, um, in which they very clearly highlight the importance of the funding scheme and we see a, a similar challenge to the commitment to so-called localizing um, um, the, the, the local localization agenda of humanitarian um, funding and uh, humanitarian practice. So the global north committing to supporting national and municipal responses to displacement, um, not necessarily actually leading to a recognition of different ways of doing humanitarian work, but rather shifting the burden um, and ensuring that, that European agencies aren't um, overwhelmed with um, particular um, groups of, of um, displaced people. So um, once you start channeling funding to local actors, whether for research or for humanitarian practice, you change the way that that research can be done. Small scale solidarity based responses, for example, start competing with other solidarity based um, um, actors um, to try and fit a mold, to learn the processes of creating accountability mechanisms and budgetary uh, spreadsheets, et cetera, rather than focusing on the kind of work that had made them fundable to begin with. And I've, I've written a little bit about this with reference to how local faith actors um, in, in Lebanon with my colleague Estela Carpi, um, how uh, local faith actors in, in Lebanon um, have tried to become part of this fundable scheme um, and how it can potentially change the way that they do their work. And we see the same with, with researchers and Marcia Vera and Gisela um, in their reflections in the roundtable talk about how the work that had been taking place in response to COVID um, had originally been um, very dynamic and very exciting, but that then funding determines what is possible and what the limits um, might be moving forward. More broadly, in my um, Southern Responses to Displacement project, we have been looking at how um, people with displacement backgrounds themselves view um, the origin and the source of funding um, and the identity of the implementer, as it were, of, um, of different humanitarian projects. And I think that also ties back to this question of um, whether it's the US, for example, funding a particular initiative or a particular form of research. So for me, what's very important is to also to identify, well, how do Venezuelan 
refugees, for example, or Colombian IDPs, how do they view the research that has been funded by USAID or other um, US institutions? How do um, people who've been displaced um, from Syria, how do they view research, not only research, but also humanitarian policies and practices, obviously, which have been funded by, um, by the European Union or by uh, UN ECHO, for instance? Um, and what comes through through some of the research that we've been doing um, is that um, whether a humanitarian um, project is funded by Saudi Arabia um, or by um, Kuwait, for example, or UAE, or whether it's funded by the EU or by the UN, refugees, people with displacement backgrounds are equally critical of the motivations and the outcomes that arise from these different initiatives. Um, so I think that we need to continue being attentive to how money dictates what is funded, um, what um, is, is fundable, um, what changes um, researchers and also local activists and national level activists need to make to make themselves attractive for that funding and then how that funding really has um, kind of pulls people away from the kinds of work that they want to be doing and that people with displacement backgrounds themselves prioritize rather than uh, states. So again, not a concrete answer, but some references also to other people who were um, playing important roles in thinking about these questions um, and um, that this is an, an ongoing concern wherever conditionalities are involved, whether they are explicit or implicit. Thank you for your question. Thanks for your answer. And uh, now we will uh, look at the chat and uh, Frederike from uh, our local team will uh, translate some of the, the chat questions to us. Yes, so um, first of all, I have to say that we received a lot of messages of people who are very thankful for this, I quote, much needed and very inspiring talk. So um, there's a discussion that people really want to, 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 to do and to engage in. And I have a question that I would like um, to read out. The one um, is, what do you suggest that should be done to address intersectional colonialities and Eurocentrism in researching on forced migration? So it's more, I think, towards the practical, the doing of um, research. And the second um, is um, about the rules of academia. There's um, one participant who wrote, I especially liked your remark about the necessity to change the rules of academia. Do you have any ideas how to initiate such a change and how it should look like? also with regards to other inequalities within academia, for example, gender. So we take these two questions maybe. Thanks, Friederike. And the floor is again yours, Elena. Wonderful, thank you. And thank you for your kind words. And um, um, I have added the link as well to the paper, which I've been referring to, which hopefully you'll find of, of relevance as well moving forwards. So how do we actually address um, the intersecting colonialities and uh, Eurocentrism? Well, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a white, academic from a northern um, European institution, even if we are currently about to go broke um, in, in the UK, given the um, financial crisis that, that we're facing, but I'm, I'm, I'm in an exceptionally privileged position and it shouldn't be me who's making um, that assertion, likewise about changing the rules of academia. I'm, I'm probably quite good at diagnosing the problems, but um, as I've been doing throughout the presentation, there are many, many people many, many voices um, who have been uh, sharing um, both critiques, but also alternatives um, for, for different forms of action, um, which I would really encourage you to, to look for and, and to engage with. Um, so what I, what I would say um, is that there is, um, there is a challenge in particular for early career researchers to be able to raise questions and to um, push for a destabilization of a system that um, is necessary for employment reasons, for example. Um, so I am a full professor, I can push the boat, I can raise difficult questions, etc, because I have the privilege of being um, uh, in that position. But I'm aware that for um, people who are um, at the earlier stages of their of their research um, careers, um, and for people who are um, in um, non non permanent positions, etc, it might be difficult to suggest that actually we need to change the entire rules of the game. Um, but what I would propose and I come back to solidarity is finding um, people um, colleagues um, from around the world who um, engage in questions and in approaches that, um, that are equitable, um, that are supportive, and that acknowledge the importance of 
in my in my personal view of prioritizing the rights of refugees over and above leading or following um, the lead of, of states and organizations. So my commitment would be to identifying ways that will make things more equitable for people who have been systematically excluded and marginalized, including refugees, but also as you've as you've uh, as, as the second comment uh, mentions, um, uh, people who've been underrepresented in um, research processes uh, and in, in different positions in, in academia. So in terms of how we can address some of the changing of the rules of academia, um, Dr. Uh, Professor Dr. Glorious mentioned this earlier as well, but in terms of um, the difficulties of finding um, partnerships with actors from the global south, for example, um, it can be difficult to secure funding, um, which enables the equitable forms of research that we might be committed to. Different funders allow you to change the rules of the game. Others don't. So Refugee Hosts was funded by a, uh, the UK's Arts and Humanities Research Council. And when I said I wanted to work with um, people who'd been displaced from Syria as equal partners, as people who would be attending workshops and sharing their findings and presenting at conferences, they said, absolutely, we pay them for their time, we pay them for their expertise, we pay them as experts. The European Research Council, when it came to my Southern Responses to Displacement project, did not have a bureaucratic model available to be able to work with people displaced from Syria as anything other than field workers. They could only envisage a way of paying people per interview that they conducted. And I had to really struggle for a whole year to ensure that we could pay people who'd been displaced from Syria to present at workshops, to cover their transportation costs, to pay for their time to write articles and blogs, etc. Um, so there are different funders who will enable you to change the rules of the game slightly. Um, and another question that arises as well is whether a funder will enable you to um, pay for um, childcare costs to ensure that your research participants' um, childcare responsibilities are covered um, while participating in a workshop also for researchers and also to look after ourselves. So uh, amongst the, the photographs that I included on my PowerPoint slide, there is a photograph of my daughter. Um, she has traveled with me for my research and I've been able to do that um, because in the first two years of her life, I spent about 10,000 pounds paying for her to come with me to conferences, to field work, et cetera. And um, I have I constantly remind my UK based um, research colleagues that we actually have the right to include um, childcare um, costs and travel costs for our dependents to ensure that we can fulfill our caring responsibilities towards our family members, in addition to implementing different politics of care to, in, in relation to our research. So I'm not sure about the, the German um, schemes of funding, but uh, one key factor that decreases women's opportunities um, for, for research are the, uh, the double and triple burden that women um, experience in, in multiple positions in research, whether it's as participants in a workshop or interlocutors in, a, in an interview, or as um, research assistants, researchers and, and principal investigators, is actually being able to care for yourself, care for your family, um, and also care for the research um, process that, that you're implementing. So look out for those um, questions when you're building your budgets, um, ensure that you can provide um, uh, childcare for your interlocutors, but also that you can factor those um, caring responsibilities into your own budgets if, if you have those caring responsibilities, um, and also not limiting that obviously to, to women, um, but also anyone who has caring responsibilities for children, for parents, uh, for partners, etc. That's part of making research sustainable as well as equitable. Thank you. Thanks so much. This uh, went further into some career consultation for the younger researchers among us. And I must say, as a mother of two who just left the house, uh, I, I have to say, you always carry a second frame with you. It's not only the research frame, but uh, the care uh, frame that you have to manage uh, parallelly. And this is really a challenge. Um, so thank you. Um, I'm Gebhardt from the University of Münster, and I, I thank you for your insight into the differences between post-colonial and decolonial theory. I um, especially appreciated how you um, differentiated Mignolos uh, versus Mbembe's approach, and I would be interested in hearing a bit more on the differentiation between giving and having voice, because um, if I understood you correctly, 
uh, you criticized the idea of um, giving voice because it has a certain paternalism inherent in the gesture of giving the voice to someone. And, um, but I want to raise a quick, a critical question regarding having or giving voice because you talked about enunciation and I was wondering if, if I, within the enunciation of having voice, isn't there a certain danger of a form of essentializing having a voice as something an individual possesses within its own subject um, and isn't giving voice wouldn't, would it be possible to kind of deconstruct the paternalistic gesture of giving voice into something where you can render visible power structures when you deconstruct giving voice, as for instance, in the quote uh, of Bell Hooks that you mentioned, where Bell Hooks talks about having a, like, a significant speech, like, isn't that more about rendering visible the structures that render you unhearable or even someone that cannot speak with Spivak. So what would you think about this differentiation between giving and having voice and isn't it more complicated? Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. Such important questions and thank you for, for raising that. So in my research, I really do try to emphasize the structural inequalities and the structures that, for example, mean that refugees who are trying to find ways of responding to their own situations, those responses are squashed because of the systems that are barriers and that prevent people from finding meaningful ways of responding to their own situation. So the structural inequalities, um, the structures of marginalization, of exploitation, etc., have to be at the forefront. Um, it isn't a matter of glorifying or of essentializing um, people's abilities or idealizing um, refugee-led responses, for example, but recognizing that people are always already responding in some way. People are always already speaking, conceptualizing, acting, etc. Um, acting in response to, to things, etc. But there are these structures that prevent those responses from being sustainable. There are those structures that prevent voices from being heard. So absolutely. But we, I think that a large, um, I'm, I was highlighting that point, because there is a very large proportion of advocacy work, of academic work, um, that feels that it is important to give voice um, and this is a term that's used extensively in advocacy. It's used as a frame of, of uh, advertising as well, of uh, fundraising, etc. Um, and I, I hear colleagues um, regularly using this term in passing um, that, that, that the key aim of their research is to give voice to the marginalized in a way that does not focus in on those structural inequalities, but rather reproduces not only paternalism and the gender inequalities that are inherent within that, the notion that, that women were irrational, children are, uh, are, are irrational in this process of infantilization, and you need the grown up who is more sophisticated, who can speak on their behalf and give them rationality and, and, and give them voice in that context. Um, but also the white saviorism, which is involved within that as well, coming back to processes of racialization and whose voice is, is deemed to be. Um, existing beforehand, um, before the intervention of the external actor and the external activist or advocacy worker, etc. So um, there, are all, there are also concerns around ableism, for example. So not everybody does have an audible voice. Um, there, are, there are different reasons why this would be critiqued, absolutely. But I think I'm, I'm speaking back to um, that tendency within uh, a particular um, sector of advocacy and research, which does posit the aim of research and of advocacy as giving voice to the marginalized. People have their own voices, they have their own forms of response. Um, and in fact, there's nothing inherent in the individualized notion of voice. We can also see um, collective approaches to that. And again, coming back to solidarity um, and to um, collective modes of responding to displacement, um, it, it's often, um, uh, I think, important to recognize the relationality of, of that voice and the relationality of, of enunciation and of listening and ensuring that there is meaningful engagement with those um, different responses. Um, so anyway, I, I look forward to reading your work as well 
on on these topics um, because it's a very important um, tension that that can exist there and an important issue that is unresolved. But it's something that has been discussed and debated for for many years from different perspectives, whether it's from African American feminists um, to um, uh, to kind of, kind of contemporary queer theorists in Eastern Europe um, to um, um, people like um, Leila Abu Lourd, um, talking about do Muslim women really need saving? These are debates relating to white saviorism, um, that they're relating to patriarchy and to paternalism. It's related to the purpose of our involvement in their promotion and what happens if we actually think about the we as the collective rather than the individual um, uh, researcher and researched relationship. Thank you. An incomplete answer yet again. Thank you so much, Elena. And uh, unfortunately, our time is used up. So uh, I uh, yeah, want uh, to thank you again for your thoughts, for your input, um, for uh, being present to, to answer questions. And uh, I'm also um, uh, uh, thanking all of you who asked questions and uh, involved in the discussion. And uh, we will, of course, be happy if you send us over the slides and we will distribute them. And uh, so we have the opportunity to, to reflect even further and I think um, we will come back to, to many of your uh, thoughts um, during the next two days of this conference. So thank you very, very much. And um, yeah, I close uh, this keynote.